Okay, the, the five golden principles of security. Um, my name is Gary Smith. I work at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, which is located over on the dry side of the state in the Tri Cities. Um, five inches of rain fall a year if we're lucky. Um, I work in the, um, but they, there's a lot of research that goes on at the laboratory, most of it geared towards biological and environmental stuff. A lot of things with cells, a lot of things with uh, surface chemistry, things like that. And I work in the Environmental Molecular Sciences Laboratory, and part of the EMSL, as we call it, um, is the Molecular Science Computing Facility, where we have a very large supercomputer and all of the infrastructure that goes on to support that. Um, I'm tasked with the security for the supercomputer and all of the related infrastructure that goes with it. So uh, security is very, very important to me. Um, so, um, why is security so difficult? It's obviously difficult because we have a hard time doing it. Um, there, you can go out to the internet and you can find all of these articles that say do this, don't do that, do these other things. But probably one of the reasons that security is so difficult is that we don't really have a way of thinking about it. At least at a very high level, or, or something to give us a way of thinking about it, a methodology. I used to work for digital, and digital had methodologies for doing everything. Um, I don't think people use the word methodology very much anymore because methodology is too hard to spell and it's too hard to digest. Why did digital go out of business then? Why did digital go out of business? <laughs> the problem, just to take a little, a little short, a short break and to answer your question, why did digital go out of business? The problem with digital is that we had too much of what we we down in the trenches like to call value-added management. Um, we had people, we had managers in the middle making a lot of bad decisions. Okay. That's, that's the basic reason, value-added management. Um, the, the problem with security is like what good old George I said, we have a problem with this vision thing. We don't have a way of really thinking about security very well. And so over the course of my career in computer security, um, I formulated this sort of personal vision of what I call the five golden principles of security. Now, um, everybody's familiar with the Nobel Prize, right? Big, big prestigious award. How many people are familiar with the Ig Nobel Prize? Okay, yeah, the Ig Nobel Prize is to the Nobel Prize what the Razzie is to the Oscar. Um, the Ig Nobel Prize recognizes somewhat less than prestigious works in science, medicine, mathematics, physics, chemistry, you name it, whatever. And one of my favorite uh, pieces of research that got the Nobel Prize was a work by two uh, gentlemen in North Carolina who did a study uh, to answer the question, does country music cause an increase in suicide? <laughs> yes, this is actually a real, a for real scholarly paper, and the answer to the question is yes. Listening to country music will make you, will, will increase the, the suicide rate. Yes? Was that a Nobel Prize or an Ig Nobel Prize? This was an Ig Nobel Prize. Oh, you said Nobel. I'm sorry, it was an Ig Nobel Prize. It's one of my favorite ones. But, but at the Ig Nobel Prize uh, ceremonies, uh, which are frequently attended by Nobel Prize winners, um, the, the winner uh, has to do two things. He has to be able to sum up, they want them to sum up uh, the thrust of their research in what they call 24 by 7. In 24 seconds or hand, seven words. Well, there's the five golden principles, and it takes less than 24 seconds to sum all these up. This is the what they are. Know your system, principle of least privilege, defense in depth, protection is essential, but detection is a must, know your enemy. Well, there's less than 24 words there, so even if you're a drawler from West Texas, you can get it out in 24 seconds, even if you're one word a second. That's all they are. 
This is how you can view security, how you can make decisions about how you want to do security. And the thing that is so great about this is that you can take these five golden principles and you can talk to system administrators down in the trenches doing this and apply these principles. You can talk to people in Mahogany Road, the big C types, CEO, CIO, CFO, CISO, all that. Use these same principles and talk to them about security and get the, get the message across to them. Somewhat different in, in technique, um, but the principles still apply. And even though I like to use these for cybersecurity, they also apply to physical security as well. That's how, how good they are. So, let's look at the golden principles. Okay, let's think about our cars for a minute in, in the context of knowing your system. Uh, you get into your car, you turn the key, and you hear a funny noise. You immediately think, hmm, something's going wrong. The valve's whining, or the alternator's about to go out, or something is going to happen like that. That's because we have this innate idea about how our cars operate. We know what sounds they make. We know how they feel. Um, uh, if you, but, but, but an interesting thing, at least I, I've been told this happens with other people, uh, I know this certainly happened with, uh, with my mother and father. She would get in the car, she would, and my father would get in the passenger seat, she would be driving, she would crank up the car, and there would be a funny noise, and she'd say, you hear that? And his reply, of course, always was, hear what? Um, I think he was just doing this so he didn't have to work on his car. But, um, the, the idea is that we, we have an idea about how our cars sound. We have sort of a knowledge about how our cars sound. And we should have the same sort of sensitivity to weird things that are going on for our computer systems that we're taking care of. We need to know something about them. Um, let, let's take an example. Okay. Um, we're familiar with the top utility, but this is a slightly different view of top. Did you know that top will show you who your money, who your big memory users are? If you do the greater than sign, Pop will show you who your big memory users are on the system. Okay. Um, anything look unusual? Well, gee, how would you know? You need to know what your system is to know what's unusual. Well, it turns out this is a real display. This is not something that I've hooked up. Um, Last year, I found a bug in the Audit D daemon that caused it to suck up memory like a frat boy at a free, at a free beer party. Um, so this is this is unusual. Audit D shouldn't be taking up 81% of the system's memory. But how would you know that unless you knew basically how your how your system worked? <coughs> So, browse your system. Know how it works. Know what's unusual about it. Okay. Um, everybody remember Sun Microsystems? Now a subdivision of Oracle. Um, Sun used to have this uh, uh, slogan. The network is the system. Okay. If the network is the system, you need to know your system, all as you should also know your network. Know what's interesting or unusual on it. So let, let's take a look at some network activity. Okay. Um, this is an actual log from one of my systems. I've changed it a little bit. But, um, <laughs> well, gee, it looks like I've got a bunch of users uh, that can't uh, get their can't type the password right. Kind of funny they all start with an F. Yeah. <laughs> kind of funny that it seems to be in alphabetical order. <laughs> kind of strange that it's also um, a bunch of different IPs from lots of different places. Even for the same username. Even for the same username. Well, 
This actually turns out to be a low and slow SSH attack on one of my systems. Uh, the, the usernames are real, the times are real, the IP address is real. But if you didn't know what your normal activity looked like, what would you make of this? You just think, well, crap, I got a bunch of people that can't enter the username right. Nothing, nothing odd. Did so, they actually show up in alphabetical order? Like yes. Yes. This is the actual, this is, uh, this is the actual attack. The times are real. The usernames are real. The IP addresses are real. They were doing a brute force SSH attack and they just have a whole bunch of names that they're trying in alphabetical order. They made it easy to spot. Incredibly easy to spot when I started looking, looking into this unusual activity. I knew something was wrong. But the fact that they were in alphabetical order, this is just a small section of it. It fits nicely on the page. Um, if you wanted to, you could go back and analyze the names and perhaps to do something from it. But, um, yeah. Um, so, know your, know your network as well. Your network is part of the system. Know your network also. Okay. Um, let's look at the, the second of the golden principles. Principle of least privilege. This says that you're not going to give um, more capabilities to a process, to a user, to a system then it absolutely needs to function. Um, this was actually a very old idea that comes from Salzer and Schroeder. Um, you don't want to give too much privilege to the process, to a user. Um, this way you limit your attack surface uh, and what people can do. Um, one of the classic examples is, is that you don't want to give users too much access especially administrative access. Um, a couple of weeks ago, somebody put out a report saying that 90% of the problems with Windows could be eliminated if you didn't give everybody administrative access to their box. Let them install who knows what, even if they don't know that malware is trying to install something on their box. Um, so. Let's look at an example of this idea of, of limiting the privilege. Willow works in the accounting department, and Willow works with accounts payable programs, and she doesn't have administrative access to her computer. But there's a reorganization that happens in the accounting department, and now Willow gets elevated responsibility because they laid some people off, and now she has to take on extra responsibility. So now she's responsible for running the end of the month reports for the accounts payable application. Okay. Now when Willow attempts to run the reports for the first time, she gets an error message that shows up in, in an application window, and Willow doesn't know what's going on, so she calls up the help desk, and um, after a while, the IT staff discovers that the problem is, is that Willow doesn't have enough privilege to run the uh, <coughs> program. So what they do is they give Willow the access, they give her root access so she can run her reports and get the stuff out. Um, this is not an uncommon sort of thing. We gotta get those reports out. If we don't, if we don't get the reports out, we don't get paid. This may not be the best situation in the world. Uh, so they give Willow a password, as I said. So now she can run the reports. What could possibly go wrong with this? Everything. 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 Let, let's just assume that there, at, that at this particular organization, that there is a weak trust relationship between the systems that make up the network. So that if somebody is root on one machine, they can go to another machine and be grouped without any trouble. Okay, maybe Willow is interested in what the CIO makes. Maybe Willow is interested in giving herself a, um, 
a better report on her salary review. There's all kinds of problems with this, and the problem is is that you've you've uh, given too much privilege to a user that doesn't need it. Yes, Couldn't she also just screw up and kill a whole bunch of stuff without even meaning to? Oh well, that's entirely possible. Yeah. True. Uh, uh, one of the one of the things that, that you have to realize in uh, computer security and system administration is that uh, don't don't blame uh, malicious intent when you can uh, uh, suffice with with sheer stupidity. Uh, people make mistakes. Uh, people type the wrong things, and they may not be malicious. They just may be uninformed. But there's there's all kinds of things that can go wrong with this with this scenario. Um, how can you I, I employ this idea of the principle of least privilege to make the situation better? Well, one thing you can do is use sudo. Sudo is, a, is on practically every Linux distribution, every Unix distribution in the world. You can limit what Willow can do, but she can get her, you can get, she can get her job done. Uh, another possibility is that you can use a third party solution. Uh, there is actually a commercialized program called Power Broker that does a uh, function similar to uh, sudo. Uh, it's uh, more network oriented and it's an enterprise type of solution. Uh, yet another possibility, and this is this one pops up quite often these days, is a virtual machine. Well, have Willow do what she needs to do inside a virtual machine, and that way. If she blows something up, well, okay, no big deal. We can get the virtual machine back, and she hasn't destroyed the world, and she hasn't doesn't have the potential to destroy the rest of the world. Yes. Would you be giving them root on the virtual machine, or would you be giving them included privileges on that as well? Uh, you would probably be giving them uh, privileges on the virtual machine, which you got the virtual machine blocked off. Okay. And the, the other thing about the virtual machine is that uh, it's much easier, in, in a lots of instances, it's easier to, if, if things go wrong on the virtual machine, you can get it back faster than you can get back and into it. Okay, send mail. Oh boy. I used to uh, <coughs> share an office with a guy who worked very early on send mail. And this was send mail back in the late 80s. Uh, every day, every weekly report he had was fixed five bugs in Sentinel, six, fixed two bugs in Sentinel, six fixed bug in Sentinel. He was constantly fixing bugs in Sentinel. Sentinel was the poster child for bad security for for a very long time. Um, the uh, the infamous Morris worm uh, was rather uh, exploitable by. Uh, uh, exploited send mail to do its dirty work. Um, the problem with a lot of email servers is that they don't give up root permissions because they need to be able to write mail into the mail directory for the individual users. Um, and they also need to be able to grab that low port. So um, classic send mail is the classic example of a program it's out there running, it's running as root, it's got way too much privilege, and it can do way too much damage. Uh, it's easy, it was easy, easily exploitable. There's lots of, all, there are other alternatives to send mail now, but send mail's been cleaned up a lot. Um, Postfix is an alternative. Um, I think XN is still around for an alternative there. Um, but back then, uh, if there was a way to make send mail do something nasty, Somebody would find a, a way to exploit it, and it would generally succeed. Um, how can we apply the principle of this idea of least privilege in this particular environment? Um, okay. Hmm. Okay. Um, long slide. No, well, not long slide. Um, Came in from the other, that popped in from the other slide. Okay, bad editing strikes again. Okay, um, some mail runs set UID. Doesn't really need set UID. All it's going to do is to write one protected file. Um, what you might want to do is make it group writable and make the program set GID, lower the, the level of privilege that it uses. 
Um, in some cases, you can run programs in a chroot or a jail environment and catch them <coughs> that way. Uh, DNS works very well if you're going to want to try to encapsulate it. Um, this may not be possible in all cases, and it turns out the SIMMail is one of those cases. But um, you can now do things with SIMMail to limit the amount of privilege it is going to have. Um, another possibility, again, use a virtual machine. Okay, defense in depth. That's the central concept for uh, the five principles of building security. And um, something I forgot to mention is, is that an easy way to remember the five principles is one and five start with no, two and four start with a P, and the central concept is the third one. So that's the easy way to remember. When I have to rattle them off, I don't. I think about that little memory trick. Oh, know your system. Principle of least privilege. Defense in depth. Protection is key. The detection is a must. Know your enemy. Okay, that's the easy way to remember. No is at the top and the bottom. Two and four start with P. The central concept is in the middle. And the central concept is defense in depth. Um, one thing a lot of people do is they think, oh, I'm gonna, I got a firewall, I'm protected. No. I've got antivirus running, I'm protected. No. The whole idea of defense in depth is you want to do more than just one thing to protect yourself. Um, this works not only for individual systems, but across the whole enterprise. Um, you don't want to do just one thing. A classic example, as I said, somebody says, I've got a firewall, I'm protected. I've got antivirus running on my PC, I'm protected. That's not enough. Just doing one thing isn't enough. Um, how many here have seen the second one, Lord of the Rings movie, Two Towers? How many people have seen it more than once? <laughs> how many people don't know how many times you've seen it? <laughs> right, isn't, isn't Cable wonderful? <coughs> isn't Cable wonderful? You can see the same movie over and over and over. Um, the, uh, if you think back to the movie Two Towers, the way Helm's Deep was set up, that's an example of defense in depth. And in fact, if you go back and look at the castles in medieval Europe, they exemplify this idea of defense in depth. Okay. Um, <coughs> look, if you look at the, the castles in Europe, they had high walls. They had places that the archers could shoot through. They had places for lookouts to be. They had boiling oil to pour down. They had, uh, let's see, what are some of the other interesting yes. things? Yeah, they had, of course, there was the moat. They had the moat around the place. That, that's actually fairly, a fairly common thing in castles. Um, there's a castle in Fougeres, France. It's interesting. Um, it has a double moat. So you get across the first moat, and then you have to go across the second moat before you're anywhere close to the castle. So your average barbarian comes along and he goes, oh, brother, two moats. I don't think I'm going to attack this castle. I think I'm going to go, go down the street and attack uh, Prince Edward's castle instead. It's much easier. So uh, that, that's, that's one way to do it. Um, th this idea of defense in depth is, I like to talk about it in terms of castles, but it actually goes back even further than the, uh, than the Middle Ages. We like to think about the way they had castles. Um, the Egyptians in about 4000 AD, 4000 BC, <laughs> no, no, it's good, I'm sorry, it's 2000 BC, roughly 4,000 years ago. The city of Bethun, B-E-H-U-N, it looks like a medieval castle. They have all the concepts of the medieval castle back then, 4,000 years ago. This is not, this whole idea of defense in depth is not anything new. Um, 
Another way to think about defense in depth is think about it in terms of tree rings. You cut open a tree and it's got these rings inside. Well, that's the way that you want to design your defenses as these rings so that the attacker has to penetrate a ring, they have to penetrate another ring, they have to penetrate another ring. And it keeps getting harder as they get closer to the interior. Okay. Um, each one is, uh, is out there. If one ring fails, the next ring may stop. So it becomes progressively harder for the intruder to get in. Um, there are five things in this idea of defense and death. And you want to block your network attacks. That's the outermost ring. You can block your network attacks off. That's your first line of defense. Block your host space attacks. Um, we, we frequently forget about the fact that uh, when we're doing this uh, defense thing, we, we think so much about all of these network attacks that we have to stop. But there's an awful lot of people that we trust, employees for instance, that we let on our systems. And we don't ever think that they're going to do anything because they're loyal employees, right? They're not going to do anything bad. They're not out to get the company. They're not out to embarrass the company. They're, they're the good guys, right? After all, we've hired them. They've got to be the good guys. What's that? Work for a bank, you'll change your money. Yeah. Um, right, yeah. That, that's actually a really bad problem is, is that um, lots of companies form alliances with other companies and they have people, you, you may end up having people working on your system that are not employed by you. Uh, classic example that happens, seems to happen over and over, is uh, uh, a fellow is working for Company A, and he's also doing something on Company B's you know, uh, computer systems because there is a business relationship between the two companies. Uh, company A gets rid of the guy, and of course they wipe all of his access out because they know all about his access because he's had to go through all of their procedures and whatnot, and they have a nice paper trail of everything that, that he's done. The company B sure doesn't. He may still have access to company B's computers and can now launch attacks against company A through company B. And that happens a lot. It seems to happen more and more these days, particularly as uh, people get laid off. Uh, they have regs against companies for one reason or the other. Um, post based attacks. You need to consider those. Um, lots of, and, and again, this may not be this may not be somebody within the company, your company, your institution, or whatever that is malicious. They just may click on the wrong link and end up installing all sorts of malware and uh, viruses, whatnot. Um, so you need to look at your post based attacks and how those can be mitigated. Eliminate your security vulnerabilities. Do you really need to run all the programs that you're running on systems? Do you need to run all the services? Do you need all the software that's installed? If you can reduce your attack surface, you'll be less likely to have damage happen. Um, safely support your authorized users. Make sure that they can get their job done. Make sure that they have the resources that they need and that um, they can get their job done. Lastly, look at ways to minimize your business losses and maximize your effectiveness. That, that's a nice sales support kind of thing. So, uh, we've got to maximize our business, minimize our business losses and maximize your effectiveness. But this comes into looking at things like how you're, you're going to do your disaster recovery and how you're going to do your contingency planning, things like that. Um, for instance, uh, and this is a little bit uh, of uh, looking at things that uh, real disasters. Um, how much did the airlines over in Europe uh, consider the possibility of an Icelandic volcano putting them out of business for a whole week? What kind of contingency planning do you do on something like that? But more towards the IT realm, there's all this dust and smoke and ash 
in the air now and how much of that is likely to get sucked into your filters and clog your filters up and perhaps change how much your cooling and air conditioning is going to work. These are, these are possibilities that, that you can look at to maximize your, your effectiveness of business and how you can do uh, contingency planning. Um, granted, a, a, an ice landing volcano is something that you probably don't really have to consider, but uh, uh, coming from Texas, it rains a lot there. Um, we, had to, we had to plan for the possibility of of uh, floods and whatnot around around here, um, <coughs> Mount Hel Mount Mount St. Helens might go again. Mount Baker here Baker. Baker. has Baker. erupted in a long time. Yeah. Mount Baker's an active volcano right up here. Yeah, exactly. Um, what what would what would the effect of something like that have on on your business or on your institution? Okay. Protection is essential, but detection is a must. Um, going back to the Helm State, uh, they had all sorts of things. They had archers, they had boiling oil to dump down on the attackers, they threw rocks, they had anti-siege techniques, like for instance when the uh, orcs throw a ladder up against it, they've got rods that they can push the ladder to make the orcs fall back down. Uh, they've got swordsmen. But none of this is any good if you don't have somebody out there walking the parapets uh, looking for stuff. Um, if, you, if you think back to the Western movies, the good old John Wayne or whenever there was a fort, there, there's always somebody <clears throat> walking the stockade, walking around the top, looking for the Indian tax. And, and frequently those are the first guys to get it in the movies. But, um, admittedly, you need somebody out there watching that something is going to happen. And in, uh, in, today's, uh, in today's realm, uh, particularly with computers, that includes log <coughs> um, logging, and stuff like that. Um, you can protect, you can harden your systems as much as you possibly can. But if you don't know that something has gone wrong, you've lost the ball game. So, the protection is great. You need to harden things. You need to reduce your tax service. You need to practice defense in depth. You need to do the principles of these periods. But you need to know that something is going on. Um, protection is an absolute must because, like I say, if, you're, if your prevention measures aren't successful, and they may not, they're not eventual. <coughs> Anybody, anyone here familiar with what's called FUD's First Law of Opposition? Uh, FUD's First Law of Opposition says if you push on something long enough or hard enough, it will fall over. Uh, that, that goes true for computer systems. Given enough time, somebody will find a way to break in. And if they do break in, you need to know about it. Um, know your enemy. This is the, the last of the five principles of uh, golden principles of computer security. Um, this comes out of Sun Tzu and his Art of War. The idea is to know your enemy as it's going into battle. This is this is counterintelligence. Uh, our military practices it a lot. Um, businesses oftentimes practice it as as industrial espionage. But the idea, in terms of the uh, computer security. Um, is you have to know what you're going to protect in order to do that protection. Um, one of the things that I like to do as far as uh, uh, knowing my enemy, there's lots of hacker sites up there. Find them. Go to them. Read their articles. Find out what they're doing. Protect yourself that way. Um, not all attackers are the same. It used to be that you had pimped guys who were 17 and they were just trying to break into your system for the fun of it. That's entirely changed now. It may be foreign governments. It may be competitors in your market. 
It may be the mafia. It may be any number of mafias. It may be the Russian mafia. It may be the Chinese mafia. It may be the good old American mafia. Yes, sir. About five years ago, there was a guy working in one of the labs, like yours, named um, Shepard. And he found where the Ministry of State Security had been breaking into government computers. The FBI was not ready to, to deal with it. Called Titan Ring. Even if you know that your enemy is doing it, if your bosses are not willing to support you and trying to counter it, what good is it going to be to raise the money? Right. This is something that I have that I have realized uh, for a long time. Is that security, at least as far as computer security, is something that flows from the top down, like water okay. or rain. Somebody at the top has to be security conscious and realize that he could lose his job, he could go to jail, he could be fined monetarily. <clears throat> at the very least, the company would be extremely embarrassed. Security has to come from the top down. Security, it, it's like water. Water flows, not water flows. It goes from, a, as the physicist would say, it goes from a place of high potential energy to lower potential energy because it's hyperrelated. Okay. Water doesn't flow uphill. Guys at the bottom cannot affect, generally speaking, they cannot affect the security consciousness of people at the higher level. It's very difficult to do. I've tried to do it. It doesn't always work. I've tried to do it, and it doesn't work either. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. You basically have to speak their language. You know, you, oh, yes. If you want to convince the CEO that this company is, a, is at risk, he's going to lose business, he's going to lose his company, he's going to lose money, you have to put in his term as far as what value it is to protect his own intellectual property. If you don't do that, then you're game fault. Right, exactly, exactly. If you can speak to these higher level people in, in the terms that they understand, <coughs> uh, loss, loss of money, loss of prestige, or going to jail, that gets their attention. They understand that. You try to talk to them in terms of, well, we need, we need, a, we need a firewall to protect us against smart attacks and all this other stuff. Forget it. You, you might as well be, be trying to explain parallel parking to a cranberry. Um, yes? Well, I disagree with you a little bit. I don't think loss of prestige for as many years as I've heard that in you know, real world practices, you know, these companies say, oh, we've lost all these records, big deal, business goes on as usual. I that's right. Think, I don't really think that's a big Yeah, and that's kind of what's happened is, that's what's happened is that by all of these companies that are that this is happening to stolen laptops, for instance, the stolen laptops with, with uh, hundreds of thousands of records on them that are ending up on eBay. That's that's almost a weekly occurrence now, and it's gotten common because of its occurrence. But when that first started happening, it was a big deal. The companies lost prestige, but now it's happening so many of them it doesn't happen to them anymore. Um, I, I think that. That, uh, that John here has the, the right uh, has the right thing. You need to speak to these upper level people in terms that they can understand. And usually that involves money. If it's going to lose, it costs them to lose money. If it's going to, uh, another way is uh, lots of these uh, upper level people have uh, lots of stock in the company. It's going to make their value of their stock go down, so it's going to hit them in their own pocketbook. And that they can understand. Um, uh, one, one of the things that I have found when I present to upper level people is try to present a pie chart. Executives understand pie charts because it's like food. And that they understand. They can see, if they see greater than 50% of the slice going out, they think, holy smokes, that's a lot of pie. I'm going to go hungry. Um, yeah. 
talk to them in things that they know. Money, job, going to jail, boom. <laughs> um, know your enemy. Um, there are lots of, there, there's lots of programs out there that the hackers use. Find out what those programs are. Find out how they use them. Learn to use them yourself. Know what sorts of things that someone else is going to find out before they find out about you. Yes, sir. But what I have seen, though, is, again, like the GRU, which is the evil twin of the KGB, or the Ministry of State Security, which is the Chinese version of the CIA, FBI, and everything else, they often have better tools than I have when I try to go against this type of stuff. That's right. And they don't put it on blocks and all that type of stuff. No, no. They know how to no. get in, find what they want, mm -hmm. clean their tracks, and they don't get caught. They're not like James Bond, where James Bond keeps getting caught in every movie. <laughs> No, no. More like script kitties. No, these are not. These are not script kitties. These are, uh, at the very least, um, state. They, they may not be sponsored by the state, but they certainly uh, leave their hands off of them. Mm -hmm. um, frequently, what happens with um, these uh, cases, like we're talking about, and, and as far as and this, this is also true in Russia, is, is that uh, the Russian government knows that there are these groups of people that are um, going after bank accounts. Well, they, they, the Russian government leaves their hands off of them, provided that they don't go after any Russian citizens, and they, they also don't go after them because they realize that these people have tools and techniques that they may need at a later date, so they don't want them rounded up and rotting in a cell in Siberia. Yes, sir. When I was looking at some of the jihadist websites, they were giving away the complete FBI forensic toolkit. Every one of the, the tools that the FBI uses when it goes after cybercrime. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the state, it's the non-state actors mm -hmm. that don't want to do just a little bit of harm. They want to kill us. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. That's um, motivation. Yeah, the, the, it's, it depends on the motivation. It's not just it's not people trying to break in anymore. I know your enemy too. Yes. Yeah, you you have to. There not every there there are lots of people out there with lots of different motivations, and cybercrime is one of the, the biggest ones these days. Uh, the mafia has discovered that it's a whole lot more profitable to yes. deal in, uh, in in terms of cyber crime and bank accounts and things like that than it is to deal in drugs. And it's a whole lot cleaner. It's also a whole lot less traceable. It doesn't require nearly in, in the... The mafia is all about money. And they understand return on investment far better than a lot of corporations do. And the return on investment for cyber crime is outstanding. <laughs> it is really awesome. Um, Isn't there some mind protections or running Linux or something like that? Because most of the target <coughs> windows is that sort of most prevalent here. Right. Um, uh, Willie Dutton was a bank robber and he was he was very successful at it, but he got caught a lot too. And finally somebody said, Willie, why is it you keep robbing banks? And he says, Easy, that's where the money is. Well, the world is made up of Microsoft stuff, and that's there he is. That, that's that's where the money is. Uh, there's there's lots of ways to make Microsoft <coughs> systems secure. Uh, it's not it's a big task, but uh, that's uh, these these uh, there there are millions of point of sale cash registers out there in the world. They're running Windows 95. What do you This is great botnet material. This is great botnet material. Um, Windows is a great attack server because that's where the money is. Um, that's one of the things that you can do. Minimize that attack server. 
yourself run vulnerable operating systems. If you've got your run vulnerable operating system, make sure that it's running as little as possible. I've done that attack surface. Okay. Um, one of my favorite tools is InMap. It's also a great hacker tool. I use it to find out what my systems are running. Of course they have open. Hackers can do it too. It's a free program. It's great. It's a wonderful program. But it's a double-edged sword. I can use it to reduce my vulnerabilities, but somebody else can use it to find out how my systems are vulnerable. Um, um, yeah. Find out what the, find out what the tools are. Find out how they're used. Um, the guy who does Nmap uh, has a wonderful website, SecTools.org, and he compiles a list every year of the 100 top security tools. And um, usually Nmap gets up there pretty high on the list, but uh, he sort of takes it off simply not to uh, self-aggrandize. But that's a great place to find out what good security tools are. Um, as I mentioned, there are a lot of hacker sites out there. I have favorites that I travel around on to find uh, vulnerabilities, what they're talking about, uh, things they may have published. Uh, a lot of it is trash. Some of it's not terribly interesting. But um, a while back, uh, last year around December, there was a new exploit in Linux kernel out, and I was able to find a code on a hacker site to exploit this particular vulnerability. I take it into work, I put it up on a virtual machine, there it work, I try it out, and sure enough, it works. It works as advertised. Started looking at the code to see how it was done. I started looking at it and I go, wow, there's actually comments in this code. <laughs> the hacker who puts comments in the code, this is something new. He actually tells you how it works inside the code. And you go, oh, this is pretty amazing. It used to be that you'd got a piece of hacker code and there might be a coin comment in there that was the name of the program and maybe somewhere in there there was another comment that said, see if you can figure out what this does. Right. Yeah. No, no. The, the hackers have uh, put in code out there. They've gotten a lot more uh, professional in their work. They're actually putting in comments into the code. And I think... Um, I think I remember another shock when I was looking at this code is that up at the top of it, there was the little header that you get from uh, using an SVN repository. So they're actually not even using revision control. <coughs> wow, pretty amazing. Um, another place to learn about security is LinuxSecurity.com. That's another good place to find out about it. Uh, they have uh, tools, they have exploit code, they have articles, uh, they've also got mailing lists. I recommend those two places. Um, okay. um, learn how the tools operate. Uh, this used to be very expensive, it's not anymore. Um, you needed lots of hardware to do this kind of thing. You don't need that anymore. It's all changed. And the answer is virtualization. I love virtualization. Virtualization is a security is a security post friend. Um, it used to be that if I were going to stand up some kind of uh, thing to test a network exploit, I had to have computers and I had to have routers and switches and cables and all this stuff. Not going to do that anymore. It's all all of it virtualization. And the nice thing about it is that there's lots of tools to do it with virtualization. There's VMware, there's VirtualBox, there's Zen, there's KVM, there's the user mode Linux, there's OpenVZ, there's a bunch of stuff. And you can slice and dice your, vir your physical machine into a whole bunch of virtual machines and virtual networks, and link it all together, try your exploits out, see what works. The vulnerabilities for virtual machines are not very well known. And you've got to go into great detail about these ones. Is one of the vulnerabilities that they have 
is they will repeat random numbers. They do not really make random numbers unless you really, really, really work at it. And you have the ability to have those called collisions and all sorts of other things happen in virtual machines. While it looks like it's secure because it's quote unquote separate, it's actually difficult to read a lot of stuff underneath the, the, the layers that could open up vulnerabilities that just aren't known at this point. Right. And that's a whole other. That's a uh, that's a presentation for another day. Security for virtual machines, um, but virtual machines are great for testing things out. It's a security guy. I love it. Um, conclusion: Network security is a very broad discipline, and it's really hard to get lost in it. It's very easy to get lost in it. Um, there, you sometimes if you want to try something, just go out to Google and just Google for best practices and see what you get. Um, you, you, would be, you would be surprised. Uh, actually, along those lines, I thought about um, having a presentation on worst practices. And maybe we can learn from those rather than learn from best practices because we don't seem to learn from best practices. Maybe we need to learn from other people's mistakes. But, that's a presentation for another time. Um, the five goal principles are a vision. It's a way to think about how you want to do security. Um, as I said, you can go to the CIOs, the CFOs, the CSOs, and use, the, use these principles to talk to them about security. You just have to talk about it differently. Rather than talking about firewalls and antivirus, you talk about knowing what their assets are, custom of your system. Uh, tell what their assets are, their intellectual property, things like that. Um, you can also use it for physical security as well. Um, you don't have to build a fortress around everything, protect your assets, um, but you can also defend against the type as they come over the hill. Okay, now, remember I said that at the Ignoble Awards, uh, for the winner of the prize, they had to explain their research in 24 seconds and in seven words. Here's computer security in seven words. Complexity is the worst enemy of security. If you don't believe this, look at Windows. <laughs> Remember the third Star Trek movie. Scotty disables the warp drive on the Excalibur. He says this great line, the more complex you make the plumbing, the easier it is to stop a toilet. <laughs> complexity is the worst enemy of security. The more complex something is, the more likely it is to fail, the easier it is to break into. Another way to phrase this, complexity is the best friend of hack. Yes, sir. Uh, Rufus, have you ever, um, is, is there a way, or have you found a way to protect against rootkit Um Protect against rootkit installations is, the, the best way around that is that principle of least privilege and keeping the privilege level down. So on my Linux systems, I use two yeah, programs. One is called RK and another one is called Check Loop Kit. Um, CHK Loop Kit. Uh, 